We are continuing our study, just introducing our study of 1 Corinthians. I don't use a lot of sports illustrations because I know people get tired of them and some pastors use them every week. Um, but it is Super Bowl Sunday, so I have to start with the sports illustration on the Super Bowl. Many people go watch the Super Bowl just for the commercials, right? Because the commercials are always amazing in the Super Bowl. Uh, some people watch it for the halftime show. Katy Perry. See, I'm, I'm relevant. I'm, I know what's going on. Who, who's Katy Perry? Never, no, never, never mind. But actually, if you're actually interested in the game, you might be aware that the Seattle Seahawks are playing the New England Patriots. Um, but in many ways, the Seahawks should not really even be here based on what happened two weeks ago. If you're a Green Bay Packers fan, you probably want to hold your ears at this point and, or, or, or scream. Um, the NFC Championship game was two weeks ago, and the Seahawks played the Packers. And the Seahawks started off um, really, really badly. Russell Wilson, who was the quarterback, had a terrible first half. He threw three interceptions. He was two for nine in passing for 12 yards in the first half. Uh, the second half, the defense is the only thing that kept them alive, but it was still 19 to 7. The Packers were ahead 19 to 7 going into the fourth quarter. And with just two minutes left, 209 left, they finally scored a touchdown, came within five points. 209 left. The game was basically over. But then the Seahawks kicked an onside kick. They recovered it. They scored, moved down the field, scored a touchdown, went ahead in the last two minutes or one minute. 22 to 19. The Packers weren't through, though. They got the ball, drove down the field, kicked the field goal, tied it up. So it went into overtime. But then the Seahawks, Russell Wilson, threw a touchdown pass and scored a touchdown in overtime. It was a great comeback win, one of the great comeback wins of, of the um, postseason. But it certainly showed one thing. There is a point to this story. Not just talk about it. <laughs> It showed one thing, that it's not as so much how you start. The Seahawks had a terrible, terrible start to that game. In fact, Russell Wilson had one of the, the worst first halves of his career. It's not so much how you start, it's how you finish. And in many ways, that might summarize the letter to the, to the Corinthians, the first letter to the Corinthians. They had a tough, tough beginning to their lives, in their context a very difficult city, a difficult background. And yet for Paul, the goal is, how are you going to finish? Are you going to come together? Are you going to recognize God's power in your life? Here's our theme. You can see it at the top. Theme of our whole series is, is learning to be light in a dark world. The church at Corinth was an unlikely group for success, just like the Seahawks in the first half. Their location, it in Corinth was a difficult location, pagan city filled with idolatry, filled with immorality. Uh, their background was a challenging one. In chapter 5, verse 6, Paul says that many of them were idolaters, many of them slanderers, many of them drunkards, many of them swindlers, thieves, sexual addicts, addicted to drink, sex, and money. Not the best candidates for the establishment of a church. Many people who've worked among, say, the homeless ministries know how difficult it is, how much your past can affect your future. If you've got a difficult past in terms of alcohol or, or, or drug abuse or, or sexual abuse or trauma in your, in your background, how that can profoundly affect your spiritual growth. And that's the church in Corinth. These are people with a past, with a difficult past. And so they are challenged. And so Paul is calling this church to come together and the power of of the Spirit to become the people that God has called them to be. All right, as I said, this is our second week, and our first two weeks are just introduction. Last week, we talked about the city of Corinth, its background a little bit, and then the founding of the church. So if you weren't here with us here, I'll review a little bit of that. We're going to talk this week about the occasion, the purpose, and the theme so last week, we saw that the city of Corinth was strategically located. Remember, it was on this little isthmus between northern Greece and the Peloponnesus down. And because it was so strategically located, um, it was a thriving center for commerce and trade. 
But when you get a thriving center for commerce and trade, you've got lots of sailors moving through. You've got lots of, lots of business people. You've got lots of new money. You also have a context of debauchery in many ways. And so it was also a place of idolatry, immorality. We compared it maybe a combination of Los Angeles, major port city, San Francisco, major cultural center, and Las Vegas. And, and we talked about that sign that archaeologists have discovered as you're leaving the city. What happens in Corinth stays in Corinth, right? Well, Paul founded the church in Corinth on his second missionary journey. Here's a map. We'll review that. Here's the second missionary journey. You might remember from last week, Paul, that what you see on the right there is modern Turkey, Asia Minor in the first century, and then Greece on the left. The Apostle Paul started churches in Galatia, which is in central Turkey, on his first missionary journey. On his second journey, he revisited those churches and encouraged those churches. Then he was headed, headed towards Ephesus. You can see Ephesus there in the south, but the Holy Spirit prevented him from going there. So he turned north into the northern region called Bithynia. The Holy Spirit prevented him from going there as well. So he ended up in the city of Troas. And in Troas, he had a vision, a momentous vision that changed the course of his ministry, a vision of a man beckoning him over to Macedonia. So for the first time, the gospel left Asia and crossed into Europe. We saw that Paul went into Philippi and started the church in Philippi, went down to Thessalonica, started the church in Thessalonica. We have letters written to both of those churches. We have Philippians written to the church at Philippi. We have first and second Thessalonians written to the church at Thessalonica. Paul then started the church at Berea, where those believers searched the scriptures daily to see that Paul, what Paul was saying, whether it was true or not. Paul then went down to Athens, where he gave his famous Mars Hill address to the intellectuals there, to the philosophers and leaders of the city of Athens, um, intellectually challenged. Then he went over to Corinth. And as we saw last week, this was a challenging start to his ministry because he had just, he was, pro, he was exhausted. By the way, I'm exhausted right now. So. <laughs> Not right now. I've had some good sleep. But all this week, I was in Grand Rapids. By the way, it's, don't go to Grand Rapids in January. Let me just give, <laughs> give you advice, all right? Fortunately, we, we missed the storm, so it wasn't, wasn't so bad. It was very cold. I, you know, it's nice to go there and visit, and, and then you get home, and you just so appreciate San Diego. <laughs> so much better. But I was videoing my... I, I, I wrote a Gospels textbook, and um, it's 20 chapters long, and they're turning it into a course. Zondervan is turning into a course. So I, I videoed 20 sessions of 20 to 30 minutes each, and we did it in three days. And so it was just absolutely exhausting. The problem was I went there, and I wasn't quite finished in my preparation. So I would we tape for 10 hours, and then I'd go back to the hotel room and try to type till midnight. So by the end, I was just intellectually, I was exhausted, and physically, I was exhausted. And this is Paul. Paul is in Athens, and he's challenged intellectually. There's all these brilliant philosophers, and he's preaching and sharing the gospel and being challenged in ways that he's never been challenged before. And then he goes to Corinth, right? And from the intellectual challenge, he walks into the city full of idols everywhere and temples everywhere and prostitution and immorality everywhere. And he's just reeling. He's just reeling. But in that context, God steps in and gives him partners. That's what we need when we're tired, right? That's what we need when we're exhausted. We need partners in ministry. And so let's look at the founding of the church briefly. This is still review from last week. If you remember, he partnered with a husband and wife team named Aquila and Priscilla, who were also tent makers and Christians, uh, Jewish Christians, believers in Jesus the Messiah. Um, they became key partners for Paul for much of the rest of his ministry. He then had success at first in the synagogue. Um, one of the, several of the synagogue leaders became believers in Jesus the Messiah. Eventually, though, the synagogue turned against him and went next door to the house of a guy named Titius Justus. Um, and in that context, he had an encouraging vision from God. That's really, last week, that was our sort of our central theme. God says, don't worry, I'm with you. This is going to be a challenging time, a challenging ministry in Corinth, trying to start this church in a very pagan context, but I am with you. And I have many people in this city. I have many partners for you in this city. So that encouraging vision there um, in Acts chapter 18, where God says, hold fast, don't stop talking, don't stop proclaiming the message. And then finally, we saw last week that Paul got a favor, dec favorable decree from the, the governor, the Roman cons proconsul over Corinth. 
the Jews opposed him and brought him to court, saying, this guy's a troublemaker, this guy is, 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 is causing riots and things and trouble in, in Corinth against the Roman authorities. And Gallio listened and he said, this is just a religious matter between you Jews. He said, it has nothing to do with political issues. And so essentially enabled um, Christianity to be a protected religion in Corinth as Paul continued to minister. So things are going well in Corinth. Paul decides, however, after 18 months, it's time to move on. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to chapter 18. That was our review, by the way. Now we'll pick up the story, the rest of the story, in chapter 18. I'm in Acts. Did I say Acts? You're, you're supposed to listen to what I think, not what I say, okay? Yeah, yeah. All right, that was a test to see if you've got your Bibles. Ah, correct. There is no 18th chapter. No, we're in, we're in Acts. I'm sorry. The, start, the founding of the church, Paul's the founding of the church, and also the context of the letter in, is in Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. This may happen several times today. Since, uh, yeah, I'll warn you. All right, look at chapter 18, verse 18 of Acts, the book of Acts, Paul's missionary journeys. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he has it, had his hair cut off in Cancria because of a vow he had taken. Maybe talk about that a little bit later. He had a haircut. Nice that we learn about Paul's haircuts in the book of Acts, right? It was, it was a Nazarite vow. It was a vow, an Old Testament vow, like Samson. You remember Samson? Where you don't cut your hair and you dedicate it to the Lord. Your time is dedicated to the Lord. So Paul is fulfilling one of those Nazarite vows here. Verse 19, they arrived at Ephesus where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised... I will come back if it is God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. Okay, so what Paul does is he's he's returning. Let me go back. to Here's the map right here. He's returning from Corinth, and he's always wanted to go into this area called Asia Minor, where Ephesus is. It's a fertile ground for the gospel. So he stops there. He's heading back to Caesarea. He's heading back to his home base over in Israel. But he stops there and he goes in the synagogue and he preaches the gospel. And the Jews there are really interested. And they said, we want to hear more. But Paul's got appointments at home, so he's got to leave. So he says, don't worry, I will return, right? I'll return to to Ephesus. Now that sets up what we call the third missionary journey. So there we have it. Um, Favorable decree. So this is the third missionary journey. Here's a map that shows the third missionary journey. Paul starts off from Antioch, that's way over there in north of Israel, in Syria, and then he visits those churches once again in Galatia that he started on his first missionary journey. Then he comes to Ephesus, and he establishes the church in Ephesus. And we get the, the, the stories related to the establishment of the church in chapter 19 of, of Acts. Um, and yeah, not first Corinthians chapter 19 of Acts. And this is this is Paul's method of evangelism, by the way. I mentioned this briefly last week is he whereas Jesus worked in villages, primarily the vi- villages around Galilee. Paul would go to the big cities because he knew from those cities he could send out assistants and helpers to reach all of the little communities around there. And so he establishes a home base in Ephesus and he stays in Ephesus. By the way, one of the great archaeological sites. If you ever get a chance to visit Ephesus, one of the great archaeological sites. So Paul stays in Ephesus for three years, longer than he was anywhere else. And he establishes the church. And it says, Luke tells us that all the region of Asia Minor was evangelized during this time. So Paul is sending his assistants, his helpers everywhere around Asia Minor. And let me just say a word about the ministry in Ephesus, and then we'll talk about the context of 1 Corinthians. Um, Ephesus was a hotbed of spirituality, hotbed of the occult, um, and especially a hotbed of worship of Artemis, the fertility goddess, also known as Diana there. And so Paul faced great challenges in terms of spiritual warfare. There's, there's one episode that's really funny. Well, it's kind of funny, funny in a strange kind of way that I want to share with you because it's in Acts chapter 19. There's all this spiritual warfare going on and Paul is actually performing exorcisms. He's casting out demons 
much like Jesus had been casting out demons. Um, and in verse 13, some not unbelieving Jews are seeing how powerful Paul is by calling on the name of Jesus. He'll call on, he'll say, in Jesus' name, I cast out a demon, and the demon will come out. And these Jewish exorcists see what's going on. They go, that's a powerful name. We're going to try to use that name as well, the powerful name of Jesus. Verse 13, some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? (laughs) Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. So don't use Jesus' name unless you believe, unless you're actually a follower of, of, of Jesus. Another story then that Paul describes in this, um, in this ministry in Ephesus is how the um, idol makers, the silversmiths, they, they would, the, the temple of Artemis was one of the great wonders of the ancient world. It's completely gone now, but it was bigger, much bigger than the Parthenon. Have you ever heard of the Parthenon um, on the Acropolis in Greece? It was much bigger and it was just a massive, incredible incredible temple with a statue, a massive statue of Artemis in it. And what they would do is the silversmiths would make these little models of the temple and they'd sell them. And they're making a fortune by selling these models of the temple to pilgrims who are coming to worship Artemis. But what happens? Paul's ministry is thriving. People are coming to Christ. People start throwing away their occult symbols. They're throwing away their idols. And the silversmith's economy dies. They're not selling many of these things anymore. So they get furious at Paul. They start a riot against him. And they rush into the theater there in Ephesus. And they chant for several hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And it looks like this could become a riot that will kill Paul, that will kill the Christians. The town treasurer stands up and he calms the crowd and he says, we all know that Artemis is great. We don't need to prove it. And in fact, if we cause a riot, the Romans are going to come in and and, and squelch the riot. And we don't want that to happen. So he calms the people and they all they all dissipate. And it's it's just one of Acts showing one of Luke showing how God is once again protecting his messengers as they take and proclaim the gospel. So Ephesus is known especially for spiritual warfare. And while Paul is in there, Paul is there three years. And this is the context of his writing of first Corinthians. He's in Ephesus ministering and he begins to hear of some trouble over in the church that he started in Corinth. Now, Paul writes a letter. Now we can turn to first Corinthians, which has 16 chapters, by the way, not 18. First Corinthians chapter five. And this might surprise some of you. But Paul is there ministering in Ephesus and in first Corinthians Chapter 5, verse 9, he writes this. He says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Now, he's talking, he goes on to say he's talking about Christians who are acting in an immoral manner. He's not talking about unbelievers. He wants them to interact with unbelievers, but he doesn't want them to interact with Christians who are, who are acting in a sinful manner. But notice what Paul says. I wrote you in a letter. Now, this is 1 Corinthians that we're reading. So what is before 1 Corinthians? pre first Corinthians, right? Paul wrote letters that we don't have. Not everything Paul wrote is in the New Testament. Obviously, the Holy Spirit did not see fit to preserve it and to pass it down. So Paul wrote one letter. In fact, we call it Corinthians A. In scholarship, we call it Corinthians A because we can't call it Corinthians 1 because this is Corinthians 1, right? We call it Corinthians A. And so first Corinthians, we call Corinthians B. It's the second letter we know that Paul writes. There's actually going to be a C and a D that we'll get to get to later on. There's other letters. There's one more missing letter, a lost letter that the, the Holy Spirit did not see fit to preserve. So in any case, during this time, Paul writes this letter. Then he gets a report after sending this letter um, to the Corinthians. He gets a report. And let's talk then about the occasion. We got through one point right now. You can see it where we are in the notes. Number two, let's talk about the occasion of first Corinthians reports to Paul from members of the church. There's basically two reports. One is from a group called Chloe's People. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now again, let me remind you what we're doing. We're looking at the situation, the occasion, the setting, why 1 Corinthians was written here. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
that all of you agree with one another in what you say, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. As we'll see over the next few weeks, this is one of the key themes of 1 Corinthians is unity. This church is divided by factions. One of the reasons this letter is so relevant to us today, because churches are often divided by factions. How does Paul know about these divisions? Look at what he says. Verse 11. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. Some from Chloe's household had informed me that there have been quarrels among you. And so who is Chloe? Chloe's people, Chloe's household. It's, it's, the Greeks literally says something like those of Chloe. Almost certainly these are either slaves or business people of Chloe. Chloe, is a, that's a female name, by the way. So she is a businesswoman, and some of her helpers or assistants or servants are in Ephesus. And they tell Paul that the church is racked by divisions. So Paul's going to write in response to these various problems. You can see we're going to divide the book into two halves, problems and questions. Uh, The second thing also is a three-man delegation has come to Paul. Hold your place here and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We're going to move around a bit today. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 17. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 16, 17, I was glad when Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus arrived because they have supplied what was lacking from you. For they refreshed my spirit and yours also. Such men deserve recognition. So this three-man delegation from Corinth brought some financial support, but as we also learned, they brought a letter, a letter which was a list of questions from the Corinthians. And so the first Corinthians, as we'll see, is going to be dealing, the first half is going to be dealing with these problems that are reported to Paul. The second half is going to be re- relating to these questions from the church, and that's going to be our simple outline of first Corinthians. Okay, so Paul responds by confronting the problems, by answering the questions, and by encouraging their spiritual growth. So here's the reason. This is called the occasion of the letter. Why was the letter written? Well, there's problems in the church. As we're going to see, there's lots of problems in the church. They're struggling in in many, many ways. Also, the church has questions. How do we deal with this? How do we deal with that? And so Paul is going to respond to those questions throughout this letter. But most important, both of these things are meant to encourage this church to greater spiritual growth, to grow up, to mature. In many ways, it's a very immature church. So Paul is calling on them to grow up and mature. But there might be something more as well going on here. You ever get a letter from someone and you can kind of read between the lines? Right? You get a letter maybe when you're younger from a boyfriend or girlfriend and, and the letter says, we really need to talk. Uh-oh. Right? You know what's coming. It, well, if it starts with dear John and your name is not John, that's even worse. But, but right? <laughs> Or maybe you get a letter from your son or daughter in college and they say, having tons of fun, but do need to study more. Read between the lines. Wait till you get my record, report card, right? I'm, I'm, I'm failing my class. So as we read this letter of 1 Corinthians, we, we kind of see there might be something else going on. And particularly Gordon Fee, the scholar who wrote just a wonderful commentary on 1 Corinthians, emphasizes this. And this, as you can see in your notes, letter C, a challenge to Paul's authority. Is there actually more than just Paul answering questions and responding? Is he doing more than just functioning as sort of the pastor of this church? Some say that the church is already sort of in open revolt against Paul, that there's some ringleaders who are saying, Paul really isn't a very good leader. We don't need to submit to his authority. So here, here's the question. Is opposition to Paul already brewing? Now, why do you say already? Because in 2 Corinthians... The second letter, right, in in our New Testament. In 2 Corinthians, this is the main issue. The church has been in open rebellion. The church has rejected Paul's authority. Paul has written them another letter. That's Corinthians C, by the way. He's he's written them another letter and 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 they've responded and repented at the end of 2 Corinthians and have come back into relationship with Paul. So the question is, is this already brewing in 1 Corinthians? Now, why do I dump this on you at this point? Because as we go through and as you read, and I hope you study along with us as we go through, look for these things and you can decide for yourselves. Do you think, do you think there's already conflict in the church? Let me show you a couple of statements. You knew I would, right? Here's 1 Corinthians 4, 
Some of you have become arrogant as if I were not coming to you. But I will come to you very soon if the Lord is willing. And then I will find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. So what do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline or shall I come to you in love and with a gentle spirit? Little tension there, right? Dad is coming home and he's got his belt, right? And can we say that anymore? I know that's, you know, that's, that's, uh, no, that, that's right. And he, it's not just to hold up his pants that he's got his belt, right? So it's like Paul says, I'm coming and there's two ways I can come. I can come gentle as a father, encouraging, or I can come with my whip, basically. So there's a little, there's tension in this church between Paul and, and the church. Here's another statement he says, 1 Corinthians 9, 3. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Who's sitting in judgment on him? Someone. It, it seems there's some leaders in the church who are already actively opposing Paul. And this, after 1 Corinthians, this is going to blow up into a major, a major conflict between Paul and the church. Here's one more. If anyone thinks they're a prophet or otherwise gifted by the Spirit... Let them acknowledge that what I am writing to you is the Lord's command. Let them admit that I'm speaking as an inspired apostle from the Lord. Now, what we're doing, we're doing something scholars call mirror reading. Mirror reading. The problem with a letter, the problem with the letter of Paul is, is what are you hearing? You're hearing one side of the conversation. You ever hear someone talking on the telephone? And they're talking to someone else and you go, yeah, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, that's wonderful. You know, you're trying to piece together what might, what might be happening on the other side. Well, what we have is in 1 Corinthians and all these letters, we have one side of the conversation. And Paul says, for those who are attacking my credibility, let me just say, what do we immediately go? Someone's attacking his credibility. So this is going on. So this is another issue that we're going to be seeing. Now, I think the emphasis, Paul is still in full of, in authority and the church still, for the most part, respects him. But there, are, there is a growing dissension, a growing conflict as well. Okay, one more issue related to the occasion that we need to deal with because it's important for Paul, and that is the collection for Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem at this time, the mother church in Jerusalem, right? That's where it all began, from Jerusalem to Judea to the ends of the earth. The mother church in Jerusalem is starving to death. There is a famine, and there's also, as there has been for years, a great deal of persecution. So Paul, all during his third missionary journey, has been going around to the various churches he started, and he's collecting a collection for the the believers in in Jerusalem to support them, to keep them alive, basically, in the context of persecution and famine. Now, Paul wrote three letters during this third missionary journey. He wrote 1 Corinthians, he wrote 2 Corinthians, and he wrote Romans. And in all three of those letters, he deals with this issue. He's collecting money for the for the poor in Jerusalem. So I just want to take you there and show you. We're in 1 Corinthians 16 again. Go back to 1 Corinthians 16. By the way, can you tell these are real letters? Sometimes we read these as though they're theology, you know, treaties, theology essays, but they're real letters written by real Christians to other Christians. To understand them, we have to enter into the world. So that's what we're doing, entering into the world of the text. Look at 16, chapter 16, verse 1. Of 1 Corinthians, not Acts. Now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. Remember Galatia? That's that first missionary journey. On the first day of every week, each, of, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. So Paul writes to the church and he says, when I'm there, I want to collect the money for the poor Christians in Jerusalem. Don't start collecting it when I get there. Start now so that it'll be ready to go. It won't be embarrassing, right? They get there and the church goes, oops, you know, we forgot that we were going to support them. Um, Now, another thing, I want to show you one more time. Hold your place in 1 Corinthians. Go to Romans because the issue is also made in Romans, but it also says something profoundly theological. In Romans, about why Paul sees this debt to the church in Jerusalem. Romans chapter, it's right before Corinthians, by the way. You're not sure. Turn to the left in your Bible and you'll find Romans, Paul's great theological masterpiece. Romans chapter 15, verse 25. 
Paul says, and this is at the end of his third missionary journey, this very journey that he's on while we're looking at. Now, however, I'm on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the Lord's people there. He's got a collection he's bringing to Jerusalem. For Macedonia and Achaia, that's Corinth, by the way. Corinth is in Achaia. We're Macedonia, that's Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea, those churches up there. He collected money from them. For Macedonia and Achaia, we're pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the Lord's people in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed, they owe it to them. They owe it to him. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them their material blessings. Now, this is profoundly significant. You've got to see what's, what Paul is saying here. He says, where does the gospel start? It starts in Judaism, right? God made a promise. By the way, we, we just studied Genesis, right? Who did God make a promise to, a covenant with? Abraham. He made a covenant with Abraham and said, through you, all nations will be blessed. And we follow the line of the Messiah all the way through. And now the Messiah has come and he's accomplished salvation. And, and as Jesus says to the Samaritan woman, salvation is from the Jews. We owe a debt to our Jewish brothers and sisters because they're the ones who preserve the line of the Messiah. Salvation came through them. And so Paul says, by, by giving money back to Jerusalem, you're just repaying the debt, right? What did the church in Jerusalem give you? Eternal salvation forever and ever. Right, you're going to help them out with a little, you know, little snack, right? Uh, you're going to help them out by, by supporting them financially. So just profoundly significant theological. we can, theologically, we can ask the question, to whom do we owe our spiritual debt? Who has gone before us, right? Who has suffered and died so that we can have this gospel, this gospel right? Translators have suffered and died to make God's word available to all people. Missionaries have suffered and died to proclaim the gospel faithfully to others. That could be a whole message, right? We won't go there. We'll run, run out of time. Okay, turn your page over and we'll get to the second half here. Paul's third missionary journey, the occasion of 1 Corinthians. Now let's look at some of the challenges the issues of this struggling church. We've talked about the location of Corinth. Corinth was a party town located in the heart of the Roman Empire. What kind of challenges did the Corinthian believers face? And as we go through the problems and the questions, you'll see it's, it's much of it is related to these overall worldview challenges. One of the challenges is paganism and immorality. Now, some of the Corinthians were from a Jewish background, so they were worshipers of the one true God. They were morally upright, etc. But many of them, as we learn, were from a, a decadent pagan background. And so they were struggling with the sins of their past. I grew up in the church and I was grew up in a, in a Christian home, so I came to know Christ at a very early age. But I used to read great testimonies of some of the great people who had just dramatic turns to Christ from, from very difficult backgrounds. I don't know if, if any of you remember The Cross and the Switchblade. You remember that, that very famous book by David Wilkerson, The Cross and the Switchblade? There was a movie made in 1970, and Pat Boone played David Wilkerson, and Eric Estrada played Nicky Cruz, who was the gang member. You remember Eric, Eric Estrada, right? Chips, chips. What are they teaching young people these days? This is just right there. So... Uh, Eric Estrada was Nicky Cruz, this New York gang member who dramatically came to Christ. And the, the name of the book and the movie is The Cross and the Switchblade because it was, it was these gangs in the 19, 1960s. But, but I grew up in the church, and we, we were asked to ha give our testimony. You know, and, and, well, I came to Christ when I was five years old. Before that, I was selling crack cocaine down on it. You know, <laughs> it's like, you know, you, you want to have some kind of dramatic testimony. And, and my, my testimony was so boring, you know. Yeah, raised in the church, came to Christ. Oh, I fell away quite a bit. There, you know, I, I, I did other stuff during high school, but, but don't really have a testimony. So it's, it's, it's hard. But, but those who've had a tough life, who've had a difficult background, are enormously challenged in many other ways. To have a church background, to have believing parents is a great blessing. It's a great blessing because in many ways you, you, you have sort of, sort of the arsenal to respond when challenges come along. If you've had trauma in your background, if you've had addiction in your background, if you've been exposed to violence in your background or, or sexual abuse, this can, be, this can scar you. This can cause great challenges as you seek to grow and mature. Well, the Corinthians are struggling with their past. They're struggling with difficult issues. They're struggling with this, an upbringing in a very pagan context. And you can see it. Paul says, you know, why are you doing this? You've got to get away from this. Well, it's not so easy to break free 
of those things that, that chain us. As, as many of I'm sure we know in this room that, that, that addictions can be really, really powerful and can be crippling. So they're struggling with paganism and immorality. Here's a second thing they're struggling with. They're struggling with pride and what we call sophistry. Sophistry comes from the Greek word for wisdom, Sophia. And as we've mentioned, the Greeks were great philosophers. They were people of the mind. What are some great philosophers from Greece? Like Plato and Socrates and Aristotle. And from this great, this great philosophical tradition came what's known as sophistry. And sophistry is the, the ability to defeat your opponent through rhetoric to argument, to be the better speaker than they are, to humiliate them if possible. Now, now you got to understand that the first century Greco-Roman world was a world of shame and honor. Those were the two greatest values. And to, to be honored in the community was the best possible thing, more important than wealth or fame, to be honored. To be shamed was the worst possible thing. And one of the ways you shamed others is by defeating them with your arguments, defeating them with your, your rhetoric. You ever watch Jeopardy? <laughs> the, the, the game show. I'm trying to think of contemporary analogies. You ever been watching? And now everybody's very smart on Jeopardy. But sometimes there's a game and there, there's, there's these two or three contestants and one of them just takes off, you know? And the other one, just for some reason, maybe it's the categories, maybe it's like, he, just, he just keeps missing them. And so it's like, well, you know, what's his name? Alec Trebek, right? He, he comes in and he says, well, head into Final Jeopardy, and this person has $10,000, and this person has negative 500 because they're stupid, you know? And, and that's, that's, you know, he doesn't say it. He never says it, but it's like, and, and you kind of feel for the person because the person kind of goes, you know, this person is being humiliated, humiliated because they, they thought they had all this knowledge, and they've been, they've been humiliated, and the other person's like, you know, they're, they're good. So that's a bit of what's going on here. That sort of sophistry is to defeat your opponent, to be honored in the community and to reject other and, and to, to reject others. Now, Paul did not have great rhetorical skills. Paul was a great writer. But evidently, when Paul got up front, this is very encouraging to those who speak. Right? That Paul was not always didn't have great rhetoric. Here's what Paul says. He says, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words. Sophistry, right? Rhetoric but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Paul acknowledges that I could not defeat these wonderful rhetoricians, right? These wonderful philosophical speakers. Paul goes on, 1 Corinthians 1, we'll get to this in a few weeks. He says, where is the wise person, the sophist? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Jews demand signs. The Jews wanted miracles. They wanted to see a Messiah who would come and powerfully wipe out the Romans. But what do Greeks want? Wisdom, wisdom, philosophical wisdom, rhetoric. But we, we believers preach Christ crucified. That's our message, right? They're looking for power. They're looking for wisdom. We're looking for a dead Messiah on the most humiliating possible execution imaginable. You know how shocking That would sound to a Greek or to a a Jew of the first century. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, a stumbling block to Jews, right? A Messiah who dies. What good is a Messiah who dies? You want a Messiah who conquers, a king who conquers and foolishness to Gentiles, a dead God, right? Crucified God. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God for the Jews, the wisdom of God for the for the Greeks. You can see what Paul is doing. He's contextualizing the message. He's looking at this this context of Greek rhetoric and sophistry and power. And he's saying, we have something that is even more powerful. We have something that is more wise. The wisdom of the the wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. Right. And the, the power of the world is powerless before the power of the cross. We'll talk about that much more in the weeks to come. It's a great the, the, the cross of Christ as both God's. God's foolish wisdom is a real theme in 1 Corinthians. All right, here's a third issue that the Corinthians are dealing with. A third issue is a dualistic worldview. Now, I'm not a philosopher, so I'm going to give you a very basic idea of what Platonism is, and you can correct me in the Q&A time if there's any philosophers here. But but basically, Plato, the great great philosopher of Greece, 
and distinguish between the world of ideas or the world of spirit and the material world. And, and he argued that the world of ideas, the idea of something was actually the only true reality and that the material world was much more simply illusion. Now, I'm just going to go there and then I'm going to leave it, right? <laughs> as our minds go, what? But that was translated into a religious context as well. And Gnosticism, you may have heard of Gnosticism, is sort of the taking of Platonic philosophy and turning it religious, where that the physical world, the world in which you live, is sort of evil and negative and worthless and of no value. And the world of the spirit is what we attain to, only the world of the spirit. And that's a Gnostic idea, that the world, the physical world is evil, the spirit world is good. And this, this infiltrated the Corinthian thinking because they were Greeks by, by, by birth. Most of them were. So it resulted in two different things, and we see both of these things in the letter. On the one hand, it resulted in hedonism. Hedonism means pleasure-seeking, right? If my physical body doesn't affect my spiritual state at all, what can I do? Whatever I please, right? I can do whatever I want with my body, and it doesn't affect me spiritually because there's this dualism, this separation between the physical world and the spirit world. And what we see as we read through 1 Corinthians is we see slogans the Corinthians are using. In some Bibles, they put them in quotes to make it clear that they're slogans, or they say, you say, you say, and we'll look at those. But here's one of them. They were saying, chapter 6, verse 13, I have the right to do anything. I'm free in Christ, right? It doesn't affect my spiritual state, so I can do anything. Here's something else they say. Food for the stomach, the stomach for food, God's going to destroy them both. You see what they're saying? They're saying, I can eat whatever I want. This is so great on Super Bowl Sunday, right? (laughs) Food for the stomach, stomach for it doesn't really matter, right? God's going to, the physical world doesn't matter. Now, in context, you'll see Paul quotes that slogan because he's using it as a euphemism. Because the Greek, they would say, food for the stomach, the stomach for food, God's going to destroy them both. Sex for the body, the body for sex, God's going to destroy them both. This is in the context of sexual immorality. There. So they're using this idea that the material world is irrelevant to justify immoral behavior. You can do whatever you want because the material world doesn't really, doesn't really matter. So that's one extreme, hedonism. There's another extreme on the other side, and that is asceticism. Right? If the material world doesn't count, then you want to separate yourself from it, and you don't want to experience it at all. An ascetic is one who, sell, who denies any pleasures in the world, basically. We see this in a number of religious traditions. Many Eastern religions, Hinduism and Buddhism, often have very strong ascetic traditions. Self-denial. If you deny yourself, then you can get much more in touch with the divine. Right? Now, there's not, you know, that's not necessarily wholly wrong. Neither of these are wholly wrong. God created food for pleasure and sexual relations for pleasure, so they're not wholly wrong. It's the abuse of them we're talking about. Here's something the Corinthians say, and I've given you a literal translation here. In chapter 7, verse 1, it says, it is good, this is a slogan they were using, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, to touch a woman is a euphemism for sexual relations. So some in Corinth were saying, it's it's good not to have sexual relations because you're you're on a higher spiritual state. So you don't. So they were breaking off sexual relations with their spouses because they were going, that was the way you get truly spiritual because anything material is carnal. Right? Anything physical is evil, is wrong, and so you only want to focus on the, the spiritual side. So they're breaking away from their relationships with their, with their spouses. So this is this Greek dualistic worldview, as we'll see, is manifesting itself in various ways. All right, here's a, a fourth key theme or issue at Corinth that's causing problems, and this is spirituality without the spirit. And by the spirit, of course, I mean the, whole, the Holy Spirit. Spirituality without the spirit, non-Christian spirituality, we could say. If I said, she's a very spiritual person, right? What could that mean? Well, it could mean she's a prayer warrior down at First Fundamentalist Baptist Church right there, right? Or it could mean she's a witch who's working with this Wiccan, and she's particularly in touch with mother goddess worship, right? A little bit different. Did you catch the difference between those two? Right, right, right. I mean, to say she's a, or he is a spiritual person, right? Spirit, is it good to be spiritual in this day and age? In our age of religious pluralism? I'm saying from our society's perspective? Absolutely, right? To be spiritual means she's a spiritual. That's always a compliment in our culture. Even if the person is a Christian, it is. If they're not a Christian, it, to be a spiritual person. Is, here, do this. Maybe don't do this. Go into a New Age bookstore. 
Go to a new, okay, don't do this, all right? Don't let your children do it. Go and, and, and ask the, the person working there, um, tell me about your spiritual journey. They'll go, oh, I don't have any spiritual journey. I'm not a Christian. I don't have any. No, they're not going to say that. Of course, they're going to have had a very significant, from their perspective, spiritual life. Well, what we see in Corinth is we have, we have people who are claiming to be spiritual. They're claiming to be spiritual. They're claiming to be in touch more with their divine side, but they're, they're not connected to the, whole, the spirit of God himself. So Paul deals with this, this uh, spirituality. They're still visiting prostitutes. They're still suing their neighbors, their, their Christian neighbors. They're still shunning the poor, and yet they're claiming to be spiritual. But they're not seeing the fruit of the spirit, the work of the spirit in their lives. They're carnal. You ever heard that term? That comes from Corinthians. They're carnal. They're fleshly. They're, they're focused on the things of this world instead of the things of the spirit. Okay. Finally, finally, and manifesting those from that spirituality, we have social and economic disparities. This is a huge issue in Corinth. Now, the Greco-Roman world was strictly socially stratified, where you had the rich and the poor. And if you, whatever status you were in, you were, you were supposed to stay in that status. The rich didn't mingle with the poor. And this was spilling over in the life of the church. As we'll learn, the church at Corinth was made up of some very rich people, some very powerful people in the community, even political leaders in the community. But it was also made up of slaves and others. And, and the world said, you don't mix. You, know, you, 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 don't, you don't support these poor people. That's, you know, there, there has to be a separation. And, and this would manifest itself. And it's manifested itself in a very specific context in the church. Suppose you're having a Super Bowl party or you're, you're, you're invited to a Super Bowl party and you go to the Super Bowl party and you notice as you get in, there's two rooms. There's one room and it's just lavishly decorated over here. Then there's another room right over here. And the host says, welcome to our Super Bowl party. Your room is right over here. And you look over and you look into this room and there's this giant widescreen TV, super high def TV. And there's filet mignon and there's lobster right here, and there's creme brulee over here, and there's a baked Alaska burning in the, in the distance, right? And, 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 there's just, and, and it's like, and everyone's laughing and having a good time, and they've got the wine and all, and you look over here, and, and, and over here, they've got hot dogs, little hot dogs, and, and, you know, and, and baked beans over here, and, and there's a little black and white TV sitting over in the corner, and the host goes, you're right over here. You'd be a little disappointed, but believe it or not, this is the way it was in the Greco-Roman world. They had things called symposiums, which were drinking parties and banquets. And you would invite people only if they were just a little bit lower than you or a little bit above you. And where you sat in that banquet and the food you got, we'll see this. I'll give you quotes later on as we go through 1 Corinthians, right? And that the food you got, the place you sat was determined by your social status. Because the point of going to the banquet was to show where you are in the pecking order. And to honor certain people and to shame, well, to, to keep others in their, in their place. And so this is, this is what's going on. And, and guess what context this is beginning to, is this happening in Corinth? The Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. Because the, the church, the early church practiced what they called the love feast. You ever heard of the love feast? The agape, the, the, the love feast. They would come together and they'd share a meal together. And at the climax of the meal, they take the Lord's Supper together, right? Well, the people of Corinth are going, hmm. Now, if we go, what about those poor people, right? So, so, so what they're doing is the rich people are coming early with their feasts, and they're eating their feasts, and they're coming an hour early. You know, we're starting it at, at you know, at, at 6 o'clock. So they come at 4. And by the time the poor people come in, Paul says, some of you are hungry and some of you are drunk. This is what he says. He's, he literally says, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So they're, they're treating the poor with contempt. Why? Well, the poor are the poor. They're supposed to be poor. They're, you know, it's their own fault that they're poor. We, we rich, so the, so the rich are coming. They're eating their feast ahead of time. And Paul is aghast. He says, it's not the Lord's supper you're eating. That's specifically what he says. It's not the Lord's. It's your own suppers you're eating. You, you think, and then, then he says, your worship services do more harm than good. Now think about that. There's God's indictment. Is that ever an indictment on our churches? I hope not, right? Your worship, it's better, it would be better off not even to meet together because you're doing more damage than, than you're doing positive things. So this is, this is the, the fifth thing, the social and economic disparities between the rich and the poor. Okay, we're out, we're out of time. I'm just, um, the structure of 1 Corinthians, I've already told it to you. You can see it there. If we had time, I was going to go through each of the, each of the categories, um, but we will go through all of the categories as we walk through 1 Corinthians. I want to give time... Um, 
Okay, here it is. So there's, there's problems at Corinth. There's questions from Corinth. I'll just point out what the problems. Disunity is a problem. Failure to deal with sin. Failure to practice church discipline. Lawsuits. The Corinthians are suing each other. Sexual immorality generally. Those are the key problems at Corinth. Then there's questions from Corinth. Questions on marriage and divorce. That's never an issue in our context, so we're totally irrelevant, right? Food sacrifice to idols. That's a great one for dealing with gray areas, things that aren't necessarily sin but can become sin in our lives. Um, about proper worship, head covering. Should women cover their heads in worship or not? We'll deal with that and deal with you women who aren't covering your heads in worship. Like this, right? And the Lord's Supper. That's chapter 11, the one I just mentioned. Spiritual gifts, things like speaking in tongues, healings. That's not an issue in our churches today, right? The, the issues. So you can see how relevant. And then about the resurrection. What's resurrection life going to be like, right? Um, Heaven is for real or not, right? And, and how are you going, how's heaven? So you can see Corinthians is full of issues that are of, of direct contemporary relevance to the church today.